want you to know that because of the positive feedback we have received about these chats this year, we have decided to continue with them again next year. So, starting in January 2016, these sessions will once again be held on the second Tuesday of every month from 12 to 1. So the first one in January will be on January, Tuesday, January the 12th at 12 o'clock. We will also continue to make them available on our website by following the link to PDTV in case you can't listen in to the live presentation. I realize that this timing doesn't work for everyone, but due to the number of support groups we have, all meeting at various times throughout the week, we can't find a time and a day that suits everyone. So we will continue with the same day and time each month. If any of you listening today don't know how to access the chats online, please write to my CEO, Debbie Davis, at D-E-B-B ie dot davis at parkinsoncno dot ca or call me at 416-227-3375 or 1-800-565-3000 extension 3375 and we will ensure that you get connected. After all, Everything I have to say is so very important, I wouldn't want anyone to miss a word of these talks. Just kidding. So, now that we've all got that sorted out, the way, let's get on with today's topic about the myths of Parkinson's disease. I will use the word levodopa and synermet even prolopa, interchangeably. So I want to ensure that I don't confuse you with these terms. I realize that many of you on the line today have had Parkinson's for several years and have been taking levodopa, commonly called Cinemet or prolopa, for several years. But regardless of whether you are newly diagnosed or have had Parkinson's for some time, there are still several misconceptions about Cinemet that I want to address today. I would say that the most common comment we hear, especially from people who are newly diagnosed, is that Cinemet only lasts for five years, or levodopa loses its effectiveness after five years. And therefore, many individuals don't want to start taking it right at the beginning. Personally, I don't understand where this comes from. I have never read or heard anything like this from any of the specialists or any reliable literature available today. The truth is that Cinemet, or Levodopa, never loses its effectiveness. Having said that, at the same time, I can understand why some people think that their medications are no longer working. So here is what's going on. We don't have any medications yet that will either slow down or stop the progression of the disease. So Parkinson's does gradually and slowly worsen over time, even with the gold standard treatment of Cinemet. In spite of all the research that has been done, we still don't know why the cells in the brains that are responsible for producing dopamine in people living with Parkinson's and all of us, have gotten sick and died prematurely. And as a result, dopamine producing cells continue to die off after the diagnosis is made. The good news is that in the early stages of the disease, the symptoms of slowness of movement, stiffness and tremor are very responsive to levodopa and the positive benefits of medication often last for many years, providing people living with Parkinson's with a good quality of life for several years. In case you are wondering how long the benefits of Cinemet will last in your particular case, no one can tell you that, because as you know, everyone with Parkinson's is different. 
but I have known individuals who have not required any change in the dosage or increase in the number of pills that they need to take for, in some cases, 10 years. Remember, the progression is, in many cases, very slow. Over time, people start to have problems with their posture, i.e. they become flexed or stooped and start to lose their balance and even have freezing of gait where they get stuck sometimes when they're trying to walk. These are late onset symptoms that levodopa doesn't touch and this, I believe, is where people are under the misconception that their levodopa has actually stopped working and has lost its effectiveness. Listen carefully, please, to the following statement. Levodopa never did treat those symptoms. So levodopa is still as effective as it ever was in treating slowness and stiffness. It's the progression of Parkinson's that is actually the problem. So just to recap what I'm trying to get across about levodopa and cinemet in this first myth. Levodopa remains effective throughout your lifetime of taking it. It's the disease progression that's the problem. In other words, you are constantly but very slowly losing your naturally produced dopamine. And as a result, it becomes harder and harder over time as the years go by for the cinemat that you take by mouth to try to keep up with those loss of dopamine cells that you had once had producing lots and lots of dopamine. So it's actually the progression that's the problem. As Parkinson's progresses, new symptoms can appear that are unresponsive to levodopa, such as the ones I've mentioned already, stooped posture, loss of balance, and freezing of gait. Some patients use this myth as a reason to delay in taking levodopa at the beginning, and that is not a good idea. The second myth I want to talk about today is starting treatment with a dopamine agonist instead of levodopa in individuals who are over 70 years of age. Dopamine agonists, which are drugs such that you may know by the names of Requip or Repinerol or Mirapex or, uh, prepan not pr yes, Propanolol, sorry, and also the new agonist, the patch called Nupro. These are medications that mimic the activity of dopamine in the brain. Note, I said these drugs mimic the activity of dopamine. So, unlike dopamine, they are not actually converted into dopamine. Their job is to fool the brain into thinking that it is getting more dopamine than it actually is. Each of the agonists can be combined with levodopa, and this combination is often useful in the treatment in moderate or advanced Parkinson's. Some physicians prescribe a dopamine agonist alone as the initial drug in the patients who are newly diagnosed and are in their 30s, 40s, and even 50s, thus delaying the introduction of levodopa. I think they do this primarily to avoid some of the potential side effects, such, for, such as dyskinesias or those involuntary wobbly movements. Most common, though, excuse me, most commonly, though, doctors start prescribing the agonists after the patient has been taking levodopa for a number of years, especially those who have experienced what we call those motor fluctuations, that's frequent on and off time, as the agonists often increase the amount of on time. The point I'm trying to get across here is that while agonists can be very beneficial, particularly in young, newly diagnosed patients, as well as in combination with levodopa in moderate to more advanced patients, it is not the treatment of choice 
for individuals who are newly diagnosed at the age of 70 or older. The reasons for this is that the agonists are weaker than levodopa, but even more importantly, they are also more likely to cause hallucinations, confusion, and psychosis in older individuals if they pres are prescribed as the only therapy right at the beginning. So to sum up this myth, we know that everyone who takes levodopa will develop dyskinesias, which are those involuntary, dance-like, wobbly movements which arise after long-time use of this medication. In order to avoid dyskinesias in younger people, some doctors prefer to, pres to prescribe the dopamine agonist but because dyskinesias don't appear for several years, the drug of choice is levodopa, as it remains the gold standard of treatment for Parkinson's. Also, dopamine agonists are more likely to cause psychiatric symptoms, such as hallucinations, that's when you see things that aren't there, as well as confusion, particularly, again, in older patients. Dopamine agonists can be very useful when used on the right patient, at the right time, and in the right amount. If you were diagnosed in your 50s and you started on an agonist, and now you're taking levodopa as well and are in their 70s, there is no reason to stop the agonists as it is not causing any problems. It's only a problem for people in later life, for example, folks in their 70s, when that's the only medication that they are taking. Once again, and I know I have stressed this point several times this year, if at all possible, please try to see a neurologist who is experienced in movement disorders. Not all neurologists are created equal. That's just the way it is. The first stage of treatment for Parkinson's is an accurate diagnosis. This is tricky as distinguishing Parkinson's from other diseases with similar symptoms in particular it can be very difficult. Also, the treatment and management of Parkinson's, particularly as the disease progresses, and progress it will, slowly but surely, that also can be very difficult for those reasons and it is important to see specialists who have expertise in all things related to Parkinson's. The third myth I want to talk about today is that some people believe that there is a maximum amount of Cinemet you can take, that there is only a certain amount that can be exceeded, and therefore this myth makes people reluctant to take increased doses as necessary in order not to exceed that limit. The maximum amount of levodopa, be that cinemet or prolopa, that an individual can take is the maximum you can tolerate that does you good. I'm going to repeat that. The maximum amount of either cinemet or prolopa that you can take is the maximum you can tolerate that does you good. Please notice I stress the word you because once again, everyone is different. Some people can tolerate quite small amounts of levodopa while others can tolerate much more. So again, it has to be given very individually. There is no limit or magic number over which you cannot go. Once again, the amount of cinnamon you take is very individual as everyone's response to medication as well as your tolerance to it as, and the side effects you develop are unique to you. I've known people who can only take very small amounts as they develop dyskinesias, confusion, excessive sleepiness, etc., very early on. 
but if a person tolerates it well and has symptoms of wearing off very soon, i.e., the benefit of the medication does not last until their next dose, what that means is that they are metabolizing the medication too quickly. It doesn't stick around long enough, and you don't have any overdose side effects, such as the dyskinesias, so you will require more medication than those who metabolize it more slowly and don't wear off as quickly. No set number works for absolutely everyone. Once again, you and your doctor have to weigh the benefit of your medication against the side effects to decide what your individual limit is. Patients with young onset Parkinson's who are mildly symptomatic should always start Cinemet from the beginning. This is the fourth myth I want to discuss with you today. You'll notice that I will talk about symptoms and, and aspects of Parkinson's and gear them more to the newly diagnosed early onset people with Parkinson's as well as to those of you who have had Parkinson's for, for several years because I don't know who is listening, where you're at, what stage you're at, what age you're at, so I wanted to direct some of these myths to different people in different age brackets and at different stages. For the purpose of today's talk, therefore, I'm going to define young onset Parkinson's as Parkinson's that causes symptoms in a person older than 20 and younger than 50. Young onset people with Parkinson's develop side effects to levodopa more quickly than the older population. For example, those in the 20 to 50 age bracket usually develop dyskinesias within one to five years, while those 60 and over with dis don't develop uh, dyskinesia often for at least 10 plus years. The physician's foremost concern when Parkinson's appears in people who are in their 30s or 40s is to how to manage the symptoms and provide the patient with the best possible quality of life for the longest possible time. As many of you are only too well aware, the anti-Parkinson's medications often do produce undesirable side effects such as those involuntary movements I've mentioned already a couple of times today, as well as motor fluctuations. That's your ons and offs, when your medication benefit is not lasting completely from one dose to the next. And hallucinations are another undesirable side effect. These are just a few of what we consider to be the most undesirable side effects to the levodopa medications. Side effects, as, such as the ones I've just mentioned, are very disruptive for anyone, but I dare say they are more disruptive for an individual who is younger, still trying to work, than it is for someone who is retired and has more time to sort out medication. Because many of the serious side effects of anti-Parkinson's medications occur after many years of use, it would seem that the simplest way to avoid these side effects is to reduce the amount of time a person is using the medication. There is a balancing act here, however. On the one hand, younger persons generally have more life ahead of them, and therefore, more opportunity to, to develop these long-term problems, and thus delaying the start of medications would be best. On the other hand, however, a younger person still has a family and a career to be responsible for, and these things are harder to fulfill as far as your responsibilities are concerned when you have Parkinson's symptoms that are in full bloom and medication would be especially beneficial 
for you at this time. So as I said, it's truly a juggling act. This really is what I call a catch-22. I mean that delaying medications seems like a great advantage for those folks under 50. But at the same time, the management of Parkinson's should concentrate on your current quality of life and not over overemphasize possible future problems that may or may not develop. I have known some younger patients who have delayed treatment because of their concerns of the development of side effects, coupled with their belief in the myth that dopamine therapy, that's Cinemet and Prolopa, is somehow toxic or loses its effect after five years. This can result in the fact that they experience unnecessary disability, and that is really a shame. The truth is that the consequences of delaying treatment too long can be more disruptive than the development of the drug-related side effects. The balance I referred to earlier is not necessarily starting treatment at the very earliest stages when, they're, when they, your symptoms cause no impact whatsoever on your function or quality of life and then not delaying beyond a time when the symptoms are really interfering with what one wants and needs to be able to do. This, again, is why I always strongly suggest that if and whenever possible, please consult a Parkinson specialist, as they will be able to help to guide you through these very difficult waters. Why age is so important as to when one develops Parkinson's and why young onset Parkinson's is so different definitely remains a mystery to this day. Myth number five. Levodopa therapy speeds up the progression of Parkinson's. The good news is that there is no evidence to support this myth. Although from time to time, this statement rears its ugly head and I have no idea once again where this comes from, but unfortunately, there are some even physicians out there that believe that taking levodopa feeds up the progression of Parkinson's, a definite myth. The most popular therapy, excuse me, the most popular theory for a cause of Parkinson's in the past decade has been something called oxidative stress hypothesis. Well, if that's not a mouthful. Anyway, if you're anything like me, when I, when I first heard this, you're saying to yourself, what on earth is that? So I'll try to explain what I'm talking about. Oxidation is a natural chemical reaction that occurs in all your cells, in all of our cells for that, for that matter. It is a necessary process for life. However, like too much of anything, too much oxidation is bad for cells. So one thought that researchers had at one time is that because dopamine is metabolized by way of oxidation reactions, the thought was, well, maybe dopamine generates oxidative stress and therefore might cause dopamine-producing cells to die off prematurely. Therefore, was it possible that giving people with Parkinson's dopamine, talking about levodopa, was speeding up the progression of Parkinson's? Still confused? Yeah, me too. Just go with me on this one. Researchers have proved to their satisfaction that levodopa does not speed up the progression of Parkinson's. So Parkinson's researchers, like detectives, continue to try to solve the mystery 
of what actually does cause Parkinson's. To this day, we still don't know. There are lots of theories bandied around out there, but the bottom line is, unfortunately, we still don't know what causes Parkinson's, and if you hear anyone say that they know exactly why they developed Parkinson's, then you can say, sorry, that's a myth. You can also direct them to us, and we'll help to set them straight, because no one, not even the most brilliant researchers in this whole wide world, know exactly what causes Parkinson's. Myth number six. Everyone who is diagnosed with Parkinson's should stop driving. Well, I know this is a very touchy, touchy subject with many of you out there. And I have known many families where the topic of driving and should the Parkinson's, in the person with it, Parkinson's continue to, to, to drive. It's really a very contentious issue. But I think it needs to be discussed, and I'm going to discuss it right now. I, me, Sandy Jones, I consider driving to be a privilege. It's not a right. As someone who drives to and from work every day, I spend an average of 70 to 90 minutes behind the wheel of my car on the 401. And I encounter many individuals who, in my opinion, should not be behind the wheel of their car. Now, of course, I never ask anybody about my driving, and I rarely have passengers. But I dare say that there might even be people out there who, in their opinion, feel the same way about me. That woman should not be behind the wheel of her car. Well, I hope that's not true, but as I said, I pass many people or many people pass me, and I think, oh my gosh, did they get their driver's license out of a box of Cracker Jacks? Anyway, when I started to write about this topic, one of the first things I came across was the following statement. Research shows that people in general outlive their ability to drive by 9.4 years for women and 6.2 years for men. Yet most drivers do not retire from driving. Hmm. Let me think that again. Research, research shows that people in general outline their ability, outlive their ability to drive by 9.4 years for women, and in the case of men, they outlive their ability to drive by 6.2 years. But, as you know, most drivers do not plan to retire from driving. I know I was surprised by this statistic, and I'm sure many of you are surprised by this as well. The more I looked into this, the more I realized that I really need to do a whole lunchtime chat about this. So that's one thing that I will tackle next year. <clears throat> a whole lunchtime chat on to drive or not to drive, that is the question. But for the purpose of today's chat, I will just touch on, should everyone with Parkinson's stop driving as soon as the diagnosis is made? Just like everything else about Parkinson's, the answer varies from person to person. And no, I'm not trying to get out of the topic. It's just that's the way it is. It's no secret that most people overestimate our own driving capability. And for that reason, it is very important to be realistic about the risks involved and to listen as well to the concerns of others. The benefits of the comfort, convenience, and freedom that come from being able to drive your own vehicle are obvious. But these benefits mean very little when they are measured against our legal and moral obligation to avoid hurting other people. For some people who are newly diagnosed, Parkinson's symptoms are minimal. 
as they are in a very early stage of the condition. For other people, however, even though the diagnosis is new, the Parkinson's is not new, and as a result, their symptoms are more severe. For this reason, it is not possible to make a general, blanket, one-size-fits-all statement as to whether or not a person with Parkinson's should or should not drive from the day of diagnosis. The bottom line is that if you have any concerns about your ability to be a safe driver or, and this next statement is a really important one, so listen carefully, if your family have expressed concerns and have expressed doubts about your driving, it's time to consult your doctor about whether you are still safe on the road. Your doctor may refer you to have a driving test. I'll tell you right now, up front, these tests are very expensive. What I mean by that is they can cost up, up, upwards of over $600 for these tests. But if you take your driving safety, driving safety seriously, and if you value the lives of others, including your own and your family members, it might be worth going for a test. I will go into much more detail when I chat with you about this in a talk that I will dedicate it to this very contentious but important topic in the new year. Myth number seven. Everyone with Parkinson's will eventually develop dementia. Well, experience tells me even the mention of the word dementia is frightening to most of us. I know it is to me, for sure. It is very important to understand that not everyone with Parkinson's will experience cognitive changes. An increasing amount of research on this topic now shows that over 50% of people with Parkinson's do experience some degree of cognitive, incline, cognitive decline, if I could talk, it would help. But not all of those individuals go on to develop dementia. <clears throat> we tend to throw terms like cognitive decline and dementia around as though they are interchangeable. But in actual fact, they are very different. Cognitive decline often refers to is often referred to also as cognitive impairment. And these things include difficulties such as problems with concentration or paying attention for any length of time, problems with making plans or with planning an event or a trip, for example, problems with making decisions, problems with problem solving, especially complex problems, problems finding the right word to describe what it is you want to say. It can take longer to formulate your thoughts, and that, coupled with the inability to follow a complicated conversation, often makes individuals reluctant to join in conversation, because by the time the, Parkinson, the person with Parkinson's processes what is being said, and finds the right words to make a comment, the conversation has gone on to another topic, and they have missed the opportunity to express their opinion. These symptoms can be very isolating for that reason, and sometimes people don't want to go out or even have people over for a visit because they simply can't follow the rapid conversation that's going on around them. Memory is often also impaired, but if the individual is given some hints or some clues, that's often enough to stimulate the memory. Therefore, that is not dementia. These symptoms can be very frustrating and annoying, but don't usually have a serious impact on one's daily life, especially in the early stages. Mild cognitive impairment can be seen 
even at the time of diagnosis. Dementia, on the other hand, is described as a serious decline in cognitive challenges to the point where they have significant impact on functioning and daily life. Dementia occurs late in the disease process in older individuals, i.e., it is very rare in people under the age of 65. Symptoms of dementia are often the most difficult for care partners as well as families to cope with, and the person with Parkinson's who have dementia are very dependent and become dependent on others to function and cope with their activities of daily life. So I think it's worth repeating again that although over 50% of people living with Parkinson's do experience some degree of changes in cognition, not everyone goes on to develop dementia. Development of dementia in Parkinson's represents progression of the disease, usually after several years of motor impairment. As with everything else about Parkinson's, everyone is different. Myth number eight. Everyone with Parkinson's develops severe and disabling dyskinesias. So, what the heck does that word dyskinesia exactly mean? Many of you listening today are all too familiar with this word, but some of you may be hearing this term for the first time. So, to be fair, I'll start from the beginning. Many of you will have seen Michael J. Fox at some point over the past 10 to 12 years and have noticed that he moves a lot regardless of whether he is sitting or standing. Some of you may think that those wiggly movements are part of the natural progression of Parkinson's disease. Wrong. <clears throat> those movements actually reflect an excessive response to anti-Parkinson's medications. <clears throat> Sorry, speaking of wobbly, my throat gets a bit sore and uh, very dry these days. I'm just coming off the end of a, a quite a bad cold, so I apologize for my needing to stop periodically for sips of water. Okay, so again, I repeat, the movements of dyskinesia actu actually reflect an excessive response to anti-Parkinson's medication. So, I'm getting my head of myself. I'll back up the bus for a minute. The term dyskinesia comes from D-Y-S, that's dys, meaning not correct or difficult, and kinesia, that's K-I-N-E-S-I-A, referring to movement. This condition, just think of Michael Fox, is where a person makes what appears to be rather odd writhing, random, wiggly movements, and may involve the face, mouth, tongue, head, arms, trunk, or legs. These can vary from just a few movements in the fingers of a hand to whole body movements. Sometimes those twisting movements of the body make it difficult even for the individual to walk. So how do we know that dyskinesians are a result or a side effect of too much levodopa? Well, before medication, that's before levodopa or levodopa was discovered, before those medications were available to treat the stiffness, slowness, and walking problems of Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's didn't have any wiggly movements. In fact, they had very few movements altogether. After several years of treatment with the medication, the brain system becomes sensitive to the drugs, resulting in these dance-like movements. If you don't understand dyskinesias, they can look pretty scary, and many people refuse to take medication that they could really benefit from because they are afraid they will develop these movements. My experience with dyskinesias as well is what Folks with Parkinson's who have dyskinesia have shared with me. 
is that they would rather move too much than the alternative of not being able to move, period. Dyskinesias vary in severity and may be very problematic in many people who are also on, who are on the medication. These movements can be of mild and of no concern, and for many, they don't interfere with their activities at all. Because they are a side effect of medication, they can be diminished by reducing the dose of anti-Parkinson medication. <coughs> Sorry. The good news is that for those people who have a good response to levodopa, dyskinesias are most often an, indicate, an indication that the medication is indeed resulting in benefits. <coughs> Sorry, guys. I apologize, though, for that. So <clears throat> if the dyskinesias occur when your levodopa is working at its optimal level, this is called peak dose dyskinesia. I'll put that another way. The most common time for dyskinesia is when your medications are at their best effect. Therefore, the name peak dose dyskinesia. So, just to confuse matters even further, some people actually experience dyskinesia both when the positive effects of the medication are starting, that's when you begin the dose, as well as when the effects are waning at the end of the dose. And there are also some individuals whose dyskinesias take the form of painful muscle spasms known as dystonia. A few minutes ago, I said that the fact that if some dyskinesias are indeed a side effect of the anti-Parkinson medication, the dosage can be reduced. But let me be clear about this, however, and I have no doubt that many of you already know what I'm going to say next. If the dosage of your anti-Parkinson's medications is reduced in order to improve these abnormal dyskinetic movements, almost invariably, the resting tremor, problems with walking, and slowness of movement will worsen. People with Parkinson's are often not aware of their dyskinesias. Many people have told me that their involuntary movements are not nearly as worrisome as they had anticipated they would be when they first began treatment. So dyskinesias, in my opinion, are what I refer to as a necessary evil. Because given a choice, most people prefer to have those wiggly movements when they move too much to the times when they are off, medications are at a very low dose, and they are very stiff and slow, and may even have a very troublesome tremor. So the question is, to move or not to move? It's obviously your choice, but with, when faced with this question, I know which ones I would choose. <clears throat> okay, so for the final few minutes of my chat with you today, I'm going to quickly go over a few more myths, and then if you have any questions about these and want more details about them, just call me and I'll send, or send me an email and we can discuss these in more detail. Another myth is that if a person with Parkinson's appears to be having a good day, then they feel good all the time. If your family and friends only see you when you're having a good day, then it is difficult for them to understand that you do have a chronic condition that is quite serious. I know it's human nature to want to put your best foot forward when you're out or having people over, but you know better than I do how things can change from day to day and even from hour to hour. You can't be mad at people for not being supportive if you are only letting them see you on your good days and not on the difficult ones. I've heard many people complain 
that their families and friends don't understand them. You can't be mad at people for not understanding your struggles if you don't let them see the real you. Also, if you're in a situation at some point when you really need their help, they might run in the opposite direction because your condition will frighten them and they don't know how to help you. This applies to those of you who are caregivers too. If you don't show your children and your friends what your life is really like and what you do day in and day out, you can't expect them to step up to the plate and offer to give you time off when that's exactly what you need and want them to do. Another myth is that your doctor knows exactly what drugs you need and can also predict your future. A lot of people have told me over the years that they think their doctor should know exactly what type and dose of medication that they need. And quite often, they do get it right. But from time to time, they're not, they don't get it right. But right from the get, at least they don't get it right right at the get-go. But with so little information to go on, keep in mind there are no lab results or x-rays and it's only your history and their expertise and experience that they have to guide them. Sometimes it can take a few trials as well as some errors to get the right fit for you. Also, if you show up at your appointment and say everything is fine, you can't expect them to treat what they don't know about. They don't have a crystal ball. I've also had people tell me that they think their doctors are being very secretive that the doctor knows exactly what they're going to be like the next year and the year after that, etc. As you know, everyone with Parkinson's is different. Different on many levels. Different symptoms, different response to medications, different progression, as well as everything else. <coughs> In terms of research, understanding the causes and progression of Parkinson's, this is all still in its infancy. Unfortunately, your doctor does not have a crystal ball and really can't predict how quickly or how slowly your Parkinson's will progress. They aren't being secretive or dishonest with you. They simply don't know. Another myth that sometimes people get caught up in is that depression is, has no uh, place in the Parkinson's world. But that's just simply not true. And next year, I'm going to address uh, the moods that come along with Parkinson's, including depression. Depression is not just a matter of mind over matter can be a reactive depression, of course, to being told that you have Parkinson's, but it's often what we call a clinical depression, where in fact there are other chemicals in your brain that are being disruptive and disrupted by the fact that you have Parkinson's and definitely needs to be treated. So whether it's depression or you're just having a bad day, again, these are things that need to be talked about with your physician and gone into into much more detail. Again, I'm going to um, address this next year as well. And another common myth about Parkinson's is that people with Parkinson's just don't care that they are just that they are um, have just they've lost interest in everything and that they've become very introverted, etc. But there is indeed part of Parkinson's called apathy. Apathy and Parkinson's disease occurs in, in as many as 50% of people with Parkinson's, and yet it remains one of the mo more under misunderstood symptoms. Apathy is a condition separate from depression. It's also separate from anxiety, and yet those are two of the most common mood-related symptoms of Parkinson's. It is similar to both of both depression and anxiety, but again, it's not just that the person simply doesn't care. 
they actually, again, have a biological disorder that is also associated with Parkinson's. So the last thing I want to address today is a, related to a question that I have received. And thank you to this individual who sent in a question. This caller has said, I am often short of breath just doing everyday things or even just walking. I rest and I have a snack and I feel better. I was blaming it on the humid weather conditions. Is there a correlation between shortness of breath and Parkinson's? The answer to that is maybe. So it, it is an occasionally experienced as a symptom of Parkinson's and it may dramatically respond to levodopa-related medications, but obviously lung conditions such as pneumonia or asthma or even heart failure can also cause shortness of breath. So this is one of those things that people think um, that may, may or may not be associated with Parkinson's, but they need to get other possible causes for their shortness of breath, <clears throat> breath checked out before they blame Parkinson's. I have mentioned many times in my talks, Parkinson's is not responsible for everything. So the first thing that this individual who's asked the question needs to ensure is that all other possible medical causes for the shortness of breath have been ruled out. If everything else, if all those other tests are clear, there's no indication of heart disease, there's no indication of any lung issues such as pneumonia, for example, then it could be Parkinson's. Um, so again, the, your physician should consider other serious causes, as I said, such as heart disease or problems with your lungs before jumping to the conclusion that Parkinson's is responsible for the shortness of breath. Again, these have been excluded. Parkinson's should be considered. So <clears throat> another thing that this brings up is, does Parkinson's affect your lungs? <clears throat> lung damage does not occur in Parkinson's. The uh, lungs are, are with, in people with Parkinson's have an appearance that is normal and the same is true for the heart. So although we think of Parkinson's as affecting muscles, it does not affect your lungs and is, it does not affect in um, heart disease. It, it does not affect your heart. Parkinson's results in no damage to either heart muscles or lungs and does not cause your heart to fail. So if that is something that you were wondering about, therefore the answer is no, that it, it does not affect those things. I haven't got time today to go into all of the things that happen as we breathe, but uh, if you're wondering if your shortness of breath is from your Parkinson's, and this is sometimes it can be difficult to be certain whether it's Parkinson's or another cause, I'm just going to go over a few clues that your shortness of breath may be due to Parkinson's. Shortness of breath could have a variety of other causes, and as I said, if it's related to Parkinson's, uh, the first question to ask is, does the shortness of breath come and go? If the answer is yes, shortness of breath may be occurring as a levodopa off state. So we talk about your ons and your offs when your medications are working and when they're not as effective. So if it could be meaning that your levodopa is at a low ebb and therefore you're more in an off state. So it's important to consider the following. If the shortness of breath is primarily being experienced when your tremor, your gait is freezing, when you have more slowness and stiffness, these are when you're in a levodopa off state, may re be related to the fact 
that you're not taking enough levodopa? Is the shortness of breath absent when your tremor and slowness are gone in your levodopa on state? So again, this would give you a clue that this is definitely related to your medication happening when you're, it's the shortness of breath is occurring, in other words, when you're off, and then it resolves when you're on. And does it occur during the times of dystonia? That is, does it happen when um, you have a foot and your, or your calf or your toe is cramping? Because painful dystonias are also a sign of being in a levodopa off state. So if the shortness of breath is linked to when your Parkinson's medications are at a low ebb, then the treatment is obvious. You simply employ the strategies that would be described for treating off problems. In other words, make sure your doctor is aware that this is happening and possibly could have an increase in your medication. So again, as I said, there are many possible causes for your shortness of breath. And again, if you wish further information about this, please don't hesitate to write to us again. And I'd be happy to go into more detail or give me a call, 416-227-3375 or 1-800-565-3000, extension 3375. I just want to take a little bit of time now that the, my chat is finished for today to wish you all the very best of this holiday season that's coming up. I can't tell you what a pleasure it has been that in preparing my lunchtime chats this year, I've really enjoyed them. I hope you've enjoyed it too. I've learned a lot in my preparation and I hope you've learned something too.